Good evening. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. So glad that you joined us for this keynote presentation in our 2021 Biennial Conference, 1946 Reconsidered, the post-World War II Ohio Valley. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank our event sponsors, the CENS Foundation and an anonymous friend of the Filson. The work of organizing these sessions and following them up with peer-reviewed publications, further study and public conversation would have been impossible without their support. Thank you again for joining us for tonight's presentation, The Year of Peril, America in 1942. Tracy Campbell is the E. Vernon Smith and Eloise C. Smith Professor of American History at the University of Kentucky. He's a native Kentuckian who received his undergraduate degree from UK and his PhD from Duke. He has taught at UK since 1999, where he teaches recent American and Kentucky history. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy Campbell. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you. I, I know when we talked about this maybe I don't know, many months ago, we'd hope we could do this in person. Uh, and I hope we can at some point soon. And I'll, I'll take a rain check on that. You had asked me to think about why frame something around a year, whether it's a conference or if it's um, a book. And before I got into my presentation tonight, I want to just kind of maybe deal with that for a second because I had no intention of, of framing a book around a year. In fact, I don't know, I, I guess I, I, I thought of yearbooks as they are called, kind of as uh, cliche, kind of cheap really. They all have the same theme that this year, fill in the blank, is the most important year ever. And when you get into them, you see that they try, even if the events aren't there to say, well, at least it laid the groundwork for something important that would happen. And I, I had no intention of doing that. I wasn't interested at all in that. I was doing another project when the 2008 financial crisis started. And it, it really kind of shook me to the core because I, as a, um, someone who had under, who had studied a lot about the Great Depression, who had, I thought was reasonably up to date on a number of economic issues, was watching not only a national, but you know, potentially a, a, um, a worldwide implosion occur and feeling that kind of anxiety, feeling that kind of, of fear really. I remember going to a holiday event around the holiday season of 2008 and asking someone how they were doing. They, they, they just said, looking at the floor, I just want someone to, to, to save the world, he said. And when you leave those kinds of, of fearful moments, those moments of anxiety, we tend to mythologize them and we tend to kind of, if you know how things are gonna turn out, say, well, we got past this. And, and I wonder one day if we'll do the same with COVID and say, well, why can't we go back to 2021 when we were all together and we, we licked it with one hand tied behind our back. And it was hard to get inside of that kind of fear. So one of the things I started doing was just looking at sources to kind of relieve myself, but also to try and understand what was happening in the weeks and months following Pearl Harbor, where it, a society was really struggling to survive. FDR called it the survival war. And there's an underlying notion that you know, prevailed throughout trying to understand this year was, if you want to understand a person or an, uh, an organization, or in this case, a society, a nation, Put it under its greatest stress, see what it, see what comes to the surface. And sometimes the best and worst qualities of a person or a society do exactly that. The issue became for me, Patrick, was how to write it. And so I started thinking about it in terms of a lot of other books. You know, and I looked at a number of yearbooks, and I don't know if you're familiar with this one for your conference, but here was. I started collecting these yearbooks. Here's one from about 1946, actually. And they're usually crafted around themes. There's gonna be a chapter about politics. There's a chapter about the economy. There's a chapter about popular culture. And as I started doing that, my study really kind of lost its luster. It lost its sense of anxiety and fear. And what, made me kind of recalibrate everything was trying to relate to the reader what I was feeling in reading 
periodicals, newspapers, oral histories, government reports and dispatches in the months, in the weeks and months right after Pearl Harbor. It's a pretty dire time. And I thought I wanted to try and relate tension. I wanted to relate anxiety through history, which is a tough thing. And the only way I could do it was to try and let the sources do that. So I started thinking it in terms of month to month. And I got a lot of blowback on that. I, from my agent to my editor kept saying, not too sure about that. And so I knew I was gonna have to overcome a lot. So I just wrote the first two months, January and February, sent it to my editor. And I was nervous about how it would be received because I just didn't wanna have to recraft it in terms of politics, uh, economics, et cetera. And he sent me back a one word reply saying, send me March. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll start on March. And I, the, the key was to just kind of get out of the way and let the sources tell the story and to kind of recreate that kind of tension and anxiety. And so what I wanna to do tonight for just a few minutes, and then I, I would love to have a discussion with anyone who is who is with us tonight is to discuss that. And if we can relate to 1946 or relate it to uh, the situation we find ourselves today. So I, I'm going to share the screen for a few moments. All right. This is one of my favorite images of 1942. And for various reasons, I, I couldn't use it in the book. But to me, this is one of the best depictions of what fear looks like. It's a bucolic scene. Uh, there are no human beings anywhere. In fact, there probably aren't 100 human beings within 100 square miles of this. This is Stevensville, Montana. And if you can make out in the lower left-hand section, it says air raid shelter. So for the citizens of Stevensville, and when I check the population just a few years ago, it was less than 2000, but for the people living in this remote area, Montana, in the weeks after Pearl Harbor, this is where they could go in case there was an enemy attack. If people in Stevensville, Montana, or as inland as Kansas City or St. Louis are worried about what's coming from the sky, that can probably give you a sense of the fear that is pervading the country unlike any other time, I think, since the Civil War. So that's one image that I think can do it. Um, as I go to the next image. Right after Pearl Harbor, um, there were a series of paintings. And, and here's one of them. Um, and what I love about it is you can look at the, the woman in this, it, it, it reminds us in many ways of, of Munch's The Screen. But the series of paintings that were done with these kinds of vivid colors um, that were, were called the Year of Peril that were meant to try and, and remind Americans of just what was at stake. And here you can see the planes uh, that have dropped their bombs, uh, the destruction that's behind us, and the real fear of what could happen here within the United States. You know, Abraham Lincoln had said, it would probably be a thousand years before, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the armies of Napoleon or someone like Napoleon would ever be able to get as close to, I think he said the Cumberland River or one of the inland rivers. But with Pearl Harbor, even though it happened many miles away from from mainland United States, the real fear was what would be next. As we remember 9-11, the fear of those days and weeks after 9-11, wondering what would happen, where would the next attack be? And in the United States, that was certainly the case. Whether you were on the East Coast, worried about German attacks, or whether you were on the West Coast, worried about maybe more attacks from Japanese planes, the fear was very real in 1942 that we might not win this war, that it could be brought home and the destruction along these lines uh, could, could happen anywhere. Now, some of your, your uh, members of, of the Historical Society can remember various things about 1942. Images like this, this is outside a, a Long Beach 
uh, California factory, the United States became this industrial colossus in the, in the months after Pearl Harbor, producing what Franklin Roosevelt had said, by 1943, we're gonna produce 125,000 planes. That's an astronomical amount. I mean, we have about 3,000 planes in the military when the war breaks out. To, to talk about in terms of 125,000 within a year uh, is, is ridiculous. But, you know, and by the way, we did produce that, if not many, many more. <clears throat> It was be over 300,000 by the end of the war. So these are the images of a nation at least coming together in some respects when it comes to production. Millions of GIs leaving the country to fight either in European or Pacific theaters. And that gives way, particularly if we know how it ends, to a rather mythic image of the nation coming together. But as you look at the sources, which is what all we can do as historians is, is rely upon. It's really not that kind of a, it's a lot more complicated, it's a lot more nuanced. This is one image. Uh, I doubt if this is another image that prevailed. Uh, sometimes I've shown this and asked people where this is and they'll say, you know, is it, is it Belgium? Is it, you know, is it Munich? No, this is outside of an elementary school in Connecticut because these school kids are doing what by law, uh, they were supposed to do and how to salute the flag. The Pledge of Allegiance had become uh, the official pledge in 1942. And originally, the way you saluted the flag was to raise your right hand like this. But it didn't take long for people to realize that this was a little too close to the Nazi salute. So the law had to be amended later on in 1942 to be simple, simply placing your right hand over your heart like we're used to today. So these are the kind of, by the way, this is an Office of War Information photograph where a number of great images uh, came through. But this is one I'm not sure I was prepared for and I'm not sure a lot of people were, were prepared for. And when I went back to look at 1942, this is the Office of War Information, but this is a photograph taken of the, something called the War Rumor project. And this was something I wasn't expecting to do. I mean, as historians, we have enough trouble trying to figure out what actually happened rather than trying to figure out what didn't happen. And I wasn't planning to spend more than five minutes looking at rumor until I came upon this. And I just found this fascinating and it's becoming even more and more timely. Um, Patrick, as you know, I've been teaching a class on the history of misinformation, and this is where it really began for me. Throughout the early months of 1942, President Roosevelt had said rumor and these kinds of wild accusations about the country or about the war, or particularly about racial issues, he said, could be very, very damaging. And so the war rumor project within the Office of War Information here cataloged what people were saying to each other. They did this by asking uh, in most major cities like Louisville, um, hairdressers, bartenders, people who drove taxis to listen in on what people were saying and to report back to, the, to, the, to their local office that would then send the major rumors back to Washington where they could be cataloged, um, and categorized and hopefully with the notion of, of getting out in front of those rumors in order to dispel them, in order to fight them off. And what they found were, it's really a fascinating thing to look inside a nation filled with anxiety, filled with fear and what, they, what people were actually saying to each other according to this project. There were three major categories of rumor. One was called anxiety rumors, which you can expect, uh, which dealt with, um, you know, that we were going to be attacked soon, that there were spies everywhere, that uh, barns within 
deep within places like Iowa and Indiana had X's on top of them placed there by saboteurs to, to give bombers uh, an easy target. That was one category. The second one was called, um, um, they, they used the term either release or, or, or a way to try and get out of their own heads to try and see the war it was probably not as bad as we thought that it was much ado about nothing. It would be over by summer. Um, that Pearl Harbor had been exaggerated, that there were peace talks already underway, people didn't want them to know about it, but there wouldn't be that kind of long protracted, what, what were people fearful of? A long protracted war like we had seen in World War I. So those were two of the major, <clears throat> excuse me, categories, but it would be the third that by far was the biggest category of all. And it's what the government related as hate rumors, mostly around ethnic, religious, but mostly racial hatred here within the United States. <clears throat> now, there was one effort done by the government, as you just saw, but it also gave way to other efforts. And this was, this photograph I was able to get out of Life magazine. It looks like something out of a out of a Frank Capra movie, but this was an actual photograph of the rumored clinic in Boston. It was run by the Boston Herald. Uh, and here is W.G. Gavin hard at work, uh, <clears throat> obviously getting a lot of work done with his messy desk, but behind him, you can see established in March of 1942 is the Boston Herald rumor clinic. And what they would do is list the major rumors of the week as they were being fed them or as locals were, were telling them and giving people the counter information, you know, fact versus fiction. So when I go online and I see, you know, whether it's COVID or various other things where, you know, here's what you might be hearing, but here's what's actually happening. I think back to these rumor clinics and people like W.G. Gavin who were trying their best to get out in front of these rumors and to tell people, don't worry about it. here's what's happening. Uh, if, if the rumor is that the British are not doing their fair part, well, here's what happened the last week, those kinds of things. But interestingly, and sadly, I guess, would be that the hate rumors that you think might be confined to just say the, the West Coast when it comes to Japanese Americans or the Deep South when it comes to African Americans, made their way easily to places like Boston. These were not regional, these were actually national rumors that spread you know, well before um, Facebook or, or Twitter, they could spread just as easily many, many years ago. Now of all the rumors that W.G. Gavin or the, or the Office of War Information tried to deal with. Uh, and, and this is an example uh, uh, from, an, from the FBI. The biggest rumor of 1942, the one that they had to deal with the most, was called Eleanor Roosevelt Clubs. And I hope you're able to, to make out the exact details of this. It gives you an idea here in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, reports coming from uh, <clears throat> anonymous sources, they're redacted as per usual, but the notion is that Eleanor Roosevelt herself is organizing clandestinely uh, an effort by domestic workers to go on strike. And so that mainly white people, quote, there would not be a cook in the kitchen by Christmas and that they would have to do their own cooking and cleaning and would not have domestic help. So this is, for those of you who you know, do research, you know what I'm talking about, that when you get inside a project, you never quite know where it's going to take you. And the last thing I was expecting to do and trying to understand the economy and trying to gear up for the war or uh, the, the issues involving an, an election year, was looking at something that's as far flung and as ridiculous as this, like Eleanor Roosevelt Club, but seeing just how powerful and pervasive that kind of rumor was. And the fact that here in Jackson, Tennessee, 
the FBI is investigating gives you an idea of how seriously these rumors were taken. And a number of governors uh, went on record having the state police investigate the, the supposed existence of Eleanor Roosevelt clubs within their states. Of course they didn't exist. Of course Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't doing this. But the fact <clears throat> that these rumors were there, were pervasive. We were hearing them in Boston. We were hearing them in Seattle. The FBI was investigating them throughout the country. Gives you an idea of the kind of fear, but also uh, the, the next question for us to be thinking about is why this particular rumor? And it reminded me in a lot of ways of rumors that were pervasive throughout Reconstruction and that the world would be turned upside down racially and that those, those troops that had, had fought against uh, the Confederates are now gonna be turned on us you know, here in this particular town in order to br bring black rule, uh, you know, the old reconstruction rumors. Well, here we have rumors in 1942 and these racial hatred rumors, you know, when I started looking at the lynchings, when I started looking at the the pervasive violence that was happening throughout the country. And, and remember, our troops are still segregated. The blood supplies are still segregated. The, if there's one thing Americans, white Americans are not gonna give up on in so many places is Jim Crow, is white supremacy. And so that's why I thought looking at rumors and looking at misinformation, if you will, they certainly didn't call it then, but it, it, told, it told me a, a good story that I needed to understand in order to understand what the country was going through. And incidentally, there were a number of studies done by the government about who is listening to these rumors, who is spreading them. And they came to some, well, surprising conclusions in 1942, that the more educated someone was, the more likely they were to spread rumor or misinformation, the more that they were able to take contradictory information or say stories refuting the rumor um, and, and, and able to rationalize them anyway and find a way to explain them away. And the rumor clinics, like we saw at the Boston Herald or with, um, with the Office for Information came to the disturbing conclusion by late 1942 that the more they tried to dispel or tamp down that kind of misinformation, the more easily it spread. And that the best thing to do was to close up shop. And so those war rumor clinics uh, went away by 1943. But for, at least for me, for a historian, being able to go to the Library of Congress and to get an entire truck full when they would bring the files over of nothing but rumors, this time from Texas or this time from you know, Utah. It was an interesting experiment, one I wasn't expecting to take and one I think illuminated a lot of things that I wasn't quite expecting to do when I started this off. <clears throat> now, another thing that, you know, we hear a lot today about dysfunction. We hear a lot about dysfunction in government. Why can't government, you know, why can't Congress, why can't the White House, why can't we get together like we used to? Why can't we make things happen? And World War II, the greatest generation this time usually has the appearance or at least the myth of being something that came together. We got past our petty jealousies, or partisan politics. We buried those so that we work together to defeat this common enemy. And when we want to think about those, those days, we think usually in terms of unity. Well, this is a good cartoon that tells another story uh, that's a little different. And you might be able to see in the lower left-hand corner, this is done by Dr. Seuss, of all people, who at the time was uh, employed by PM Magazine uh, and did a number of these kinds of great sketches that all had a political bent. But this one, I think, tells 
a fascinating story as well. That's one that's not as well known, but I think it's also as timely, if you will, as the misinformation. Who should vote in 1942 is a good question. Um, particularly, in, let me put it this way, for soldiers who are leaving their homes to fight in theaters thousands of miles away, should they be able to vote in the off-year congressional elections of 1942? Well, this seems like the easiest thing in the world on its face. Of course they should. But just like we saw in the Civil War or various other occasions, it usually becomes kind of a partisan thing as in, well, who exactly are they going to vote for? And if they're going to vote against us, let's make sure they don't. Well, one of the rules was in eight states in the Deep South, you had to pay a poll tax in order to vote. And those states were not in any way anxious to give up this way of of keeping a lot of people from voting, particularly people of color. And those eight states hemmed and hawed. They weren't too crazy about allowing soldiers to vote if, if you, uh, um, you know, postpone the poll tax. They went along with it. The, that particular bill kind of took so long that it really wasn't in effect by the time the election of November of 1942 occurred. But instead, a different thing came along right after that election that I think is, is interesting for us today about voting rights and about the whole larger consequences of a democratic society uh, under great stress. <clears throat> when a bill was introduced to eliminate the poll tax altogether, it passed the House, but when it arrived in the Senate, a filibuster began, and it began in November of 1942, the same month that American troops land in North Africa. It took many, many months to train millions of troops to get them situated, to get them ready to go. Long debates between Roosevelt and his generals, and of course with Churchill about where it should occur. And once the decision was made to go into North Africa, and what was called, what Churchill called the soft underbelly. It seems like the same month that we'll finally launch that offensive. Um, you would think that the last thing that would occur would be a shutdown really in the United States Senate and a filibuster, which as we know is meant to stall things and to keep anything else from happening until Cloture, you know, is, is either voted on or, or denied and you move on. And the filibuster this time was led by the Southern Bloc against the poll tax. And the Southern Bloc was led by people like Richard Russell, by Wal Doxey, but particularly by Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi. They made it extremely clear that the whole point of this filibuster wasn't about collecting taxes. It wasn't about administering the election. It was about one thing, keeping African-Americans from voting. Their language on the floor of the Senate, uh, what was, that they didn't use code words in 1943. They made it clear and they wanted to make it clear to their constituents that in stopping this, this bill and filibustering, that it would maintain white supremacy, that it would maintain uh, the kind of voting regulations that allowed them to uh, accumulate many, many years of service. Most Southerners, most of the big committees in the Senate and the House were led by Southerners who had been there for ages. And it took many, many weeks uh, to get to this point once it was uh, the majority leader, by the way, Kentucky's Alvin Barkley, tried to get the filibuster killed at least in this case, to override it, to invoke cloture. He thought it was a medieval thing to, to have a poll tax. He also said, uh, understanding that the, the racial dynamics of it, he knew it also kept po poor whites from, from voting and that it kept millions of people, particularly in the deep south, from voting. The filibuster worked. Cloture was not reached. And to move on to other things, to funding the war, to so many other things, whether it was dealing with inflation, which we can talk about as well, 
uh, they had to give up on this particular bill. Poll tax, as we know, would eventually be outlawed by constitutional amendment in the 1960s. But of all the things that I, 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 I wasn't expecting was the kind of just unmitigated racist talk coming from the floor of the Senate, led by this man, Theodore Bilbo. And whether it was using you know, Anglo-Saxon supremacy or making clear that no armies are ever gonna make us change, that changing the racial structure of these states was something that could never be considered, even in the midst of fighting this war to defeat this hideous racist in Adolf Hitler, that democracy, we might try and make it uh, more expansive and safe abroad, but we weren't about to expand it here at home. And of all the quotes that I wasn't expecting was, well, I, I, I don't take that back. I, I, I guess I, I should have expected it, but I guess the one that just kind of jarred me the most was after the filibuster was over. Uh, Senator Bilbo came out, he met some reporters. They asked him about, you know, the, the, how appropriate is it to, to do something like this, to, to bring the Senate to a standstill in the middle of a war and just days after American troops have landed or being fired upon by, by enemy soldiers. And Bilbo, Bilbo and I, I paraphrase him, I got the exact quote in the book, but he said, in effect, what I'm doing today and what I was doing to keep the poll tax in effect was as patriotic, was as meaningful, it was as important for this country as the boys dying on Guadalcanal. He actually said that. And so those were the points that I thought needed to be brought front and center, but not in its own chapter, not in you know, just relegating it to the margins. It was a theme that pervaded the entire year. And the only way I could really kind of get at that is to talk, try and take the reader through that year as I was experienced it, looking at the sources. One of the things I did was I tried to read a number of newspapers day to day, just as you would you know, a regular newspaper. I didn't read every single article, but I would go through them in sequence, day to day, including the big Sunday papers, to try and get a sense of how people felt at the local level, but how they were feeling at the national level and what was on their minds. And so that was the way I tried to express this tension and this latent sense of anxiety that um, I was feeling from looking at the sources. You know, sometimes you just have to get out of the way of your sources and let them tell the story after you've spent, you know, about a decade digging them up, I should say. But the last thing I, I, I wanted to leave, leave you with, uh, and then we could go to q and I was at an event uh, at UK and this, this person was giving a talk. This was probably 2015 or something. And he brought up this, the search engine called Ngram, Google Ngram, which you can go into and type in a word or a phrase or a name, and it will search all the printed records in its Google library, this vast collection of the written word going back to the 16th century, really. And it would check the frequency with which a particular word or phrase or name had been used in printed word in a given year. And so I got my phone out as I was listening to this, this presentation and I, I don't know why, but I typed in a phrase and the, the, the word and the one word was democracy. And this is what came up and um, I think it's probably cut off on the right side, but you can do it now and it'll take you up through 2018 where the numbers are starting to rise. But as I looked at it on my phone in this uh, little room I was in, I just kept asking myself, this peak right here, it can't be what I think it is. And sure enough, it was. <laughs> 
that in 1942, the word democracy was used, at least in printed word, more often than any time in its, its history, whether it's 1776, World, the Civil War, um, World War I, it peaked in 1942. I was a little surprised at the time, but now uh, I certainly wasn't when I, when I finished the book because the phrase, the idea of the survival of democracy, whether it should be expanded, kept to where it is, or in some cases like the Theodore Bilbo, uh, confined if not killed, the whole idea of democracy and its fragility was something that was very much on the minds of so many people when this war began. And in looking back at it, uh, through the lens of knowing we won it, industrial capacity overwhelmed our enemies on two different fronts. It was the greatest generation, so on and so forth. It misses the point of how people felt in the heat of the moment of the crisis of the year apparel. Like I said, I, this ends, the, the, the Google Ingram viewer ends in 2018, the latest I was able to access it. I'm willing to bet that when we can, a few years from now, look at 2020 and 2021, I bet that these figures will reach the level that we saw in 1942, if not exceed it, since we are once again talking about the fragility of democracy, what shape it'll take, can it survive, whether here or other places around the world. So with that, Patrick, I will stop sharing the screen and take this time uh, ending here to see if there are any questions or anything that I could elaborate on or answer further. Well, I appreciate that. And that was, that was incredible to, to especially hear about your research process. And that's one that I'd personally like to get back to at some point. Um, but we do have some questions in the chat and please anyone get some more in there. Um, Sandy Wilson asked, did you find any evidence that, um, oops, that rumors ended up in the press despite efforts like uh, like Mr. Gavin to weed out those rumors, or do they circulate sort of in in unofficial and, and much more sort of intangible ways? Uh, I think it was the, the unofficial way. It, it was the pe things people were telling themselves. I mean, what I could do was go in. I remember there was a, a hair salon in Louisville. I forget the address, but the last thing I was expecting to do was read about what people were saying to each other in a hair salon in Louisville or in a, in a taxi, you know, in Albuquerque. But as we're experiencing in 2021, those things, what people are telling each other on Twitter or on their Facebook page is probably a lot more essential to their lives than what they might be reading in the New York Times or in some other spot. That's the thing I've been trying to get a hold of, as you know, Patrick, for a while now. And it started with this project, but it was the last thing I ever thought I'd want to do is look at what people were telling each other that was patently untrue. But those patently untrue things sometimes can dominate their lives. Uh, and that's, that's where I went with that. Abby's got another really great question here in the chat, um, thanking you for the, the, the really thought-provoking talk. And she wonders if you could tell us a bit about the nexus of race, politics, and economics in this moment. Um, she says that my sense is that the American Communist Party had gained considerable leverage at this point and united people across racial lines, potentially posing some threats to American-style capitalism. Um, do you have any thoughts about how they are, are navigating this moment? Uh, the, the communists? Yeah, and, and if that related at all to the, the Eleanor Roosevelt Club. Oh, yes, members. yes, yes. I mean, we could spend all night on Eleanor Roosevelt, why she was hated by people like J. Edgar Hoover and many others. I mean, she was one of those lightning rods who people loved and adored her and some hated her. I didn't want to get into some of the rumors about Eleanor Roosevelt, but they were absolutely vile. Um, you can imagine. OK, and so uh, part of that question was about capitalism. I thought the story of World War II is, is usually the story of unbridled capitalism and how it saved the world. 
Uh, one of the individuals of my book is, is absolutely invisible, and that's Leon Henderson. And I bet Leon Henderson, wherever he is today, is looking down at us going, uh-huh, I told you so. Like when it comes to how do you fight inflation? What do you do when a society is overwhelmed with money? And his job was to oversee the American economy in 1942. One of my favorite things, I remember looking through, uh, he, he led something called the Office of Price Administration, this kind of bucolic sounding name, but basically we had a planned economy in 1942. It was planned by people, by men wearing white shirts and black ties in bureaucratic offices, smoking cigarettes and sweating and determining the price of donuts, Bowling shoes. I remember this order came down about the price of bowling shoes. And it was the most officious thing in the world. Ten pages of how bowling shoes were. and pretzels. And I thought even then I went outside. I was in New York at the time looking at pretzel vendors thinking even the price of pretzels was determined by a bureaucrat. And it would usually come from someone named Leon Henderson, who might have been one of the most powerful Americans ever at the time, who had never been elected to anything. He was also reviled, hated, because he was determining how much I would have to pay for a rent or a car. And after the disastrous for the Democrats election in 1942, he was really the sacrificial lamb and left his job. And there's not even so much as an article about Leon Henderson, certainly no biography. So he was absolutely invisible. But in the moment of 1942, he was one of the most important people in the lives of so many people. They knew him, they knew when would the next directive come down, they would prepare for it. And so whatever it was, it wasn't just unfettered, unbridled capitalism, it was also government planners who were able to keep a squelch on, on inflation I mean, I'll just leave this, we'll get to the next question. But when Roosevelt went before Congress in January of 1942, we remember the December speech, you know, a date which will live in infamy pretty well, but it's the next month he goes there and talks about how he's gonna pay for it. It is mind blowing. 1939, when we had suggested spending 800 million, keep that figure in, 800 million on the defense, there was just an outcry in Congress about how expensive that bill was. January of 42, he goes before Congress and says, we're going to spend 59 billion. We'll get to 70 billion by uh, the spring. And I remember looking at this small article in the Wall Street Journal about all the contracts that had been let by the summer of 1942. And it added to over $200 billion, which was more money than had been spent from George Washington till December 6th, the 1941 combined. And it took Leon Henderson, the Office of Price Administration, and a planned economy to keep inflation from destroying the whole thing. If there's unfettered inflation, uh, you don't win this war. The, the numbers don't mean anything. So trying to keep a handle on the racial aspects, the financial, the economic, uh, as well as the overwhelming military things, uh, you can see why it took me about 10 years and who knows how much of my life expectancy, you know, off the chart. Um, that's, yeah, I understand how those projects can be. Um, got a great question about uh, wanting to know a little bit more about the uh, Pledge of Allegiance law. Um, what did it require? Of whom did it require um, such things? How long was it on the books? And, and were people prosecuted for not properly pledging at any point? I, I don't know the ask, I, I doubt it. No, on July 4th, for example, every major magazine was required to have the flag on its cover. So if you look at Time, Newsweek, Life, Good Housekeeping, they have the flag on there because that was a sign of our support for the war. Well, Congress also wanted to have some kind of way of acknowledging the flag itself. So the Pledge of Allegiance was adopted as our official pledge. And 
we can go to the notion that the, the words under God were not actually in there in that original and that'd be placed in later. But I was fascinated by the fact that the original way to salute the flag was the right hand. And there were pictures of these school children being taught. There'd be kids, you know, they wouldn't have their hand up all the way or they'd be like this, you know how kids are, but the, the ones wanting an A and wanting to get approval would have their hands like this and it's kind of disturbing. And it's just kind of, you know, how could this happen? Well, it, it took many months for, for people to realize, you know, this is a little too close to the Nazi salute. And so it was changed. The law had to go in, change, signed by the president to, to change it to um, one hand over their heart. It was things like that, you know, to me, the best thing I, I was able to do, I took the New York Times simply because it's easy to get and read it every day, including the classifieds. The classifieds can tell you some interesting things, you know, rent, where are we going to live, what kind of jobs are out there, so on and so forth. But it would be the little stories on page seven at the bottom that would really get my attention, like changing the salute, that kind of thing. And there was a part of this, and I really didn't want to give this up. It was such an enormously fun project. And I remember Patrick sending it off in January of 2020, thinking who is going to be interested in reading about a year in crisis? And I, I just thought, well, you know, maybe three people will, but it was interesting to try and see a society trying to come to grips with democracy, coming to grips with an economy, and who we are and what we are, the best and the worst of us coming to the to the top of the surface. And in between that, of course, the shutdown began. We have an election like we saw in 2020. And it just reminds us of the fragility of it all. And that at the end of the day, it comes down to good faith really. And that we will agree that, okay, uh, this is how we're gonna run things. I would just say it's important who is in those positions to make those kinds of decisions and what evidence they're using and what's, what are they thinking of it? If Leon Henderson deserves anything, it was our thanks because he put his own career, his own well-being in the line to try and keep the economy under control. Because like I said, if, if, if you look at the early months of 1942, inflation is the biggest threat. The Wall Street Journal is going insane thinking about what could happen if there is runaway inflation, forget about war spending, the whole thing could come, could crumble. How are we gonna get a handle on it? And so once again, history is a, is a good way for us to be looking at this, to realize that what we're going through now isn't the first time. We've had to do this before. I've got a really fascinating question um, that's asking you to elaborate perhaps on some relationship between these, these small rumors that are, are circulating around in various forms and the, um, the much more sort of larger and state supported forms of misinformation that obviously we see manifesting in Nazi Germany. Um, how, do, how do those, those sort of work together and exist at the same time? How does this big lie relate to these small rumors? Oh, terrific question, because in a war, you have to keep things secret. And so immediately the notion was, how bad was it at Pearl Harbor? What did we know? And so the rumors were different. One is that it, we were hardly scratched. They're making much ado about nothing, trying to get us in the war. The other was, we are, we are dev we're finished and everything in between. And so FDR actually went on radio to try and say, listen, I know you've been listening to this, so here's the real fact, here's what happened. And so some sociologists did a study of Harvard students who were listening to this. And at the end of it, I think I forgot, maybe a quarter to a half said they would be more likely to believe what one of their friends told them than what the president was gonna tell them. And that's kind of, you know, where we are in so many other ways. Interestingly enough, I'll just give you this little snippet. In May of 1942, there was this rumor floating around that Germans were going to land outside of the Eastern United States, come off of submarines and commit various terroristic activities within the United States. That was in May. In June of 1942, eight Germans are arrested 
Four got off submarines around Long Island. Four got off submarines around Jacksonville. And they were to converge in, of all places, Cincinnati, Ohio, where they had $150,000 in cash, fake IDs, fake Social Security cards. And they were going to inflict a series of terroristic attacks to destroy the morale of the American people. One were the locks on the Ohio River near Louisville. So just think about it. At some point in Berlin, they were thinking of what can we do to destroy the morale of the American people? Let's look at Louisville. And so rumors is a complicated, nuanced thing because in some ways, particularly say in uh, you know, in slave quarters or in Nazi concentration camps, those rumors had an element of truth to them. And that was the only way people could communicate, right? And so some of the rumors were absolutely off the wall nuts in 1942, but some went like when it came to the um, German saboteurs, maybe people were seeing things and that obviously within the next month were going to happen. We've got a couple of questions about uh, rationing, about when that kicks in, how much compliance is there? And, and you know, we see, we, we all remember the, the ration stamp books. I know a lot of people still have those passed down in family, these manifestation of this, oh yeah, we probably have a prop. Yeah, like that. Yeah, there we go. This is one so, sent to me, this is a ration book. And, you know, you would, have up here the numbers, and after you'd use them, they take one off. Rationing was a fascinating concept because everything had to be rationed. Well, everything, lots of commodities, particularly foodstuffs or various things. But the biggest one that would cause the most anger, at least the ones that I could come across, was gas rationing. And the whole point of gas rationing wasn't about gas. It was about rubber which might be a segue to something you're all going to be talking about tomorrow. Because yes, everyone join us tomorrow for that one. Without rubber, you don't win the war. And we don't have any rubber. It was one of the biggest casualties of Pearl Harbor and cutting off those rubber supplies. And it, you just can't grow it out of nowhere. And we don't have the kind of facilities to start up. Now, Louisville is kind of crucial to that, right? But getting back to rationing, I saw just tons of letters, some sent mainly to Eleanor Roosevelt because they thought she would understand that I know these rations are important, but you need to reduce them for me. We talk about, for example, this urban rural divide. Well, for rural people who depended on, you know, say large farms and having to drive a lot more than three gallons a week, they saw that they were gonna be maybe punished in ways that urban people who could depend on mass transit didn't have to worry about. And if gas wasn't the issue, why are we making such a big deal about this? And that was the, the anger that was generated toward Henderson, the OPA and so many other government agencies over gas rationing was intense. Rather quickly, uh, other commodities, whether it's, it's meat or other foodstuffs, there was a black market that was alive and well in a lot of places so that you could still get those things but still pay outrageous amounts for. And so then the next question was, do you report your neighbor? Do you, you found out that your neighbor just got some, some really good, you know, large pork chops. Okay, where'd they get those? Should they be reported? Should they then be um, you know, you know, arrested for it? I mean, these kinds of questions about what do you owe to yourself or to your community or to each other was crucial in questions whether it came to rationing, taxes. We can talk about taxes if you like. I mean, we, you wanna talk about high taxes, I show tax rates for my students and they gasp because the highest rate would go up to 88%. By the end of the war, it'd be up to 90% the highest tax rates. FDR wanted a tax of 100% on anyone making over $25,000 after they paid the rest of their taxes. Now, $25,000 is a lot more in 1942 than it is today, but the notion of a 100% tax on a certain level 
believe it or not, was extremely popular in 1942. The notion was uh, the, the rich folks aren't going to get away with this. They're going to pay it their own way and not, you know, everyone's going to, there's going to be a sense of shared sacrifice and taxes and rationing were at the center of that whole debate. I was reminded where you're talking about uh, rubber. One of the, the great collections we have at the Filson is, is Stratton Hammond, uh, the Louisville architect, who's a, an army engineer and then later a monuments man in Europe, but he's uh, building airfields um, throughout the Midwest. And, and I think he's uh, most around Columbus, Indiana um, in 1942. And what does he do? Instead of driving his Jeep around his construction site, he goes to the Rock Creek uh, Riding Club and brings up a, a stable of ponies so that he can, he can ride around. Um, his work sites instead of using his Jeep um, yeah. at that time. I think that was also to, to fulfill some romantic plantation images of, of being a Kentuckian, but um, that's, another, that's another topic. <laughs> you know, we, we think of rubber as a marginal issue. In the early months of 42, it is the scientific issue. How do you produce rubber and produce it now? Because if not, there are these dire internal communications uh, one was that if we don't produce enough rubber, we will lose this war. And even FDR said, we can't say that. Let's say we will be uh, in peril or in danger. But experts who looked at it said, we will lose if we can't produce this kind of rubber. And so that's why it was kind of front and center of so many things. That's why we had to ration gas. So you wouldn't use too much rubber on your car to save the tires. Well, again, yeah, promo for, for joining us tomorrow uh, for the presentation on Rubbertown. But it does make me think about one last question that I had about population uh, mobility. Um, you know, we obviously think about the soldiers who are being mobilized, but, but all of the civilian workers who are going into these war support industries that are being created overnight. What sort of impact does that have when you have this, this population in motion? Oh, it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a bit of a cliche that hardly anyone was not affected by the war. But, you know, people who were children at the time remember doing scrap rubber drives and the like. But yeah, to get to these jobs, people had to be uprooted and go all other places. It reminds me of a dinner conversation I had, one of the last ones I had with my mother and one of her friends who was talking about this. And they had grown up in Danville, Kentucky. And I never left, but this one woman right after the Pearl Harbor got a job in Detroit, Michigan and moved there with her and the family lived there for many years. And I remember asking, what'd you do? She goes, well, I put rivets into planes. And I, I bet the whole restaurant heard me say, you're Rosie the Riveter. But for so many people, population changes, yeah, that is a, a, a massive change. And, you know, you might want to think, you know, you're talking about 1946. What was the biggest worry people had? We're going to go straight back to the Depression. And when this war is over, and this is going back to the first question about, say, what the communists were after, Fortune magazine were saying, we're going to need a more democratic capitalism if we're going to survive. We're going to have to have a different tax structure. We're going to have to have things like universal health care. We're going to have to have the thing like guaranteed jobs. And when you talk about what a moment like 1942 or 1946 does, it allows you to think, okay, what kind of a society do we really want? And you'll be surprised what various people will be saying when they give themselves that kind of permission to say, here's what we ought to be doing. I mean, and think about where we are in 2021 and what we, if I had said five years ago, we ought to give everyone a check. And it just comes from the government. I, they'd have run me out of town. I would have been called a communist. Now we, we're in our fourth stimulus package right now. And we see it kind of as a normal thing. Well, in World War II, the same kind of questions were being brought up. Um, and I remember a poll that almost 40% of Americans said they supported the idea of taxing people 100% if they made too much money. Well, uh, we are right at an hour. Um, that I think is, is a fantastic place to end it. Making those connections through studying the past to give us better perspective on our present and our future. Um, a future that we look at 
um, with uncertainty and contingency in the same way that you have read um, the year of 1942 uh, forward. Um, I, I really appreciate this. This is precisely the sort of perspective that I learned at your seminar table. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. And like I said, I'm taking a rain check on when we can do this somewhere in Louisville over cocktails. Absolutely. Let's make it happen. We'll see everybody later. Join us tomorrow for the, the rest of those sessions. Sign up at filsonhistorical.org. Everybody have a good night.